Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way. I want to jump over the pack and here he comes. Oh, Ryan! This is Buddy Franklin! This is the greatest showman! Got the handball off to Myers. Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Randall Dazzle Rioli. Oh, who else? McDonald. Tim From inside the centre square. Boys kick the goal. whatever time of day you're listening to this this is episode 137 of americans watching the footy i'm ethan castle i am benjamin castle this past week i made my greatest contribution ever to society what is this i responded to ryan meyer's instagram story telling him since he was in philly the best cheesesteak is at woodrow's and he went there and sent me a photo and said it was great and i'm like really proud of myself Right, because that's not one of the main two, right? Yeah. The main. So, for anyone who goes to Philadelphia, great city, very worth checking out. But the main cheesesteak places are not focused on quality; they're just focused on keeping the line moving. They don't have to be good. People will just show up off of the name. Those being Pat's and Gino's. So yeah, go go to Woodrow's. Ishka Bibbles is good. I haven't been to Dalessandro's. That's one I need to try. But Woodrow's is the winner. And uh, Brian was happy because the Eagles took care of things on Thursday night. He, the trip he was on, I don't know if he's still going anywhere else on this trip, but it's very similar to the type of trip I would go on. He went to three NFL games in five days. That's about as Australian as it gets, isn't it? Yeah. Meanwhile, for us, it's like go to five footy games in three days. Yeah, we're going to be trying to basically do that in just less than two years. We're aiming at 2025 for our footy pill. Definitely 2025. It's definitely happening then. It's just a matter of when. It'll come down to, you know, other life commitments and scheduling and trying to maximize the amount of games we can go to anyway yeah go to go to woodrose meanwhile we're here on the other side of the country in the shadow of san francisco international airport that said we do have good cheesesteaks here jersey joe's and half moon bay a plus jersey joe's in san carlos a minus but yeah jersey joe's in half moon bay i have a lot of cheesesteak advice i feel like the only like Right on the coast restaurant, most people from outside the area know about here is that we have one of the few Taco Bell cantinas over in that Pacifica. Yeah, uh, those are there are more and more Taco Bell cantinas. They're becoming less rare, but that was like the first one out here, and it's like the very picturesque one that like people people know about it. People have weddings there, I think. People from a lot of places know about it, which is kind of weird. Like if you know about Pacifica, it's either because parts of it have fallen into the ocean. Or you know the Taco Bell Cantina. Yeah, because we've only got two games to recap here, the uh, the semifinals, we can kind of go off the cuff here and have fun with things a little bit. Uh, do you want to talk about the missing F-35? Excuse me? Yeah, the military lost a plane today. Uh, the pilot's safe, but I don't know what happened to the, the, the plane. Oh, oh, what? I did hear about this. This is this is somewhere in South Carolina, I think? Yep. Huh. Weird. The thing is, if was it over the ocean? Or? It was near Charleston, so can't have been far from the ocean. All right, maybe it's down there somewhere. Um, I don't know. Just what does the military have? But what does the military have? That's like all I've been thinking. Hopefully, we're not asking too many questions here. A grind Harambe just looked at me and, and is like, "What in the world are you talking about? I want to sleep." And uh. Now he's curled back up and sleeping. He hasn't covered his eyes yet, but I feel like that's close. It, it'll happen. Don't worry. It'll happen. Melbourne 91771 defeated by Carlton 11773. The Demons, the first club under the current finals format to go out in straight sets two years in a row, and the first overall since 1986 and 87 when the Swads did that. So, uh, yeah, I. Weird selection stuff here, going with a tall as a sub and Josh Shackey. It was clear that Max Gone wasn't at 100%, which makes me wonder, especially with Jacob Van Roy and out, why they didn't pull the trigger on Brody Grundy or Ben Brown. 
I would have just played Shacky over Tom McDonald. Yeah, we'd had our doubts about McDonald going into the game. I'd said last week he was slow and was invisible for three quarters. And I remember exactly what you said in the semifinal preview an episode ago that Melbourne's two biggest questions were about the Toms, McDonald and Linson. And Tom Linson had a couple boneheaded plays. There was there was one I remember he should have smothered that led to a goal. There was one that he should have just marked instead of punched. He, he was bad. Yeah. Well, it was such an obvious mistake that everyone except for the people in charge saw coming. And yet, despite their inaccuracy, again, they nearly won. It took Judd McVie being too aggressive, making a first-year mistake, not going up for the mark against Sam Doherty, and really a three-winger passage. Ollie Hollins, great as a sub, another first-year player there, to Doherty, to who else but uh, Blake Akers. Dockers fans have fun with that. You're getting a third-round pick out of that, and it's a late third-rounder. Look, he was worth a first-rounder. That's that's all there is to it. I'm not and, sure. I'm not sure at his age and it being his third club, a first rounder was viable. At, at least like a high second round or multiple second rounders. Yeah, and we knew that it was a severely underappreciated return the moment it happened, and we're proven right again and again. I mean, I would say just off of that alone, with it being a last minute goal, that Agers is a clear main character candidate. I think it's gonna be hard to to come up with a main character for this. You know, it's amazing how many things had to go wrong for Melbourne to lose this game between injuries, suspensions, missed opportunities, suspect list decisions. With all of that, they still could have won this game. And, you know, if this wasn't against the backdrop of going out in straight sets last year, you could easily just say, yeah, they had a lot of shitty luck. It's it's when you combine this with last year. I think last year was interesting because it was just more, they got beat. This time, you can chalk it up to a billion things. These are like the type of losses that leave you scarred for life. They got beat versus they beat themselves. Between, and I mean, yes, no Harrison Petty when he had just become a huge factor into that forward line. No Jake Belksham after his ACL. No Jacob Van Royen from suspension. No Agus Brayshaw from concussion. You could tell they really missed Van Royen's marking ability, and they still just kept trying to bomb it into packs, which against a team that has Jacob Wiedering, that's really fucking stupid. Jacob Wiedering and a better playing Caleb Marchbank and Mitch McGovern. It's just not a good move. McGovern, by the way, did something really smart in the final minutes to allow that goal to happen as well. When you're looking at that final goal there, and I forget who it was that pointed out, it may have been Mitch Robinson that pointed it out on Twitter. McGovern went up with Bailey Fritch, which, why was Bailey Fritch the deepest one back there? That's another thing. Like, why was that not Mayor Lever that kept themselves further back? But McGovern went up with Fritch. And that allowed the easy mark for, for Akers. So three thumbs up there for McGovern on that. And and May still had a pretty a pretty amazing game, all things considered. I mean, Lever was the stronger one early, but really second through fourth quarter, Stephen May was one of the best players on the field. And that's and that's even looking at the huge stats that other players compiled, like Sam Walsh with his 34 disposals, eight tackles, 618 meters, and two goals. And another name there in defense for the Blues, Nick Newman compiling 30 disposals, 11 marks, and 631 meters. Best sleeper pick of the year, Nick Newman? Might be. We had a, we had a few other good ones, but that, that definitely stands out. Yeah, among the teams that are left especially. But yeah, again, my whole take on this Melbourne thing is just, if it wasn't against the backdrop of how they exited last year, it would be a you, much you, you could look at this as an aberration where it's so many things had to go wrong, and they all did. At the same time, just the fact that they were bombing it just, Irritated me so much when you have the capable smalls. I was begging to see more out of Kate Chandler. Even when Kazi Pickett just decided, I can't score, fuck it, I'll get suspended instead. That was a guy who had a ton of ups and downs in this game. You know, he's struggling with his set shots for a while. He ended up 2-3 for the game. Uh, so did Bailey Fritch, who just didn't play all that well in his couple of games in his injury return. But I, I mean, he kicked five straight against the Swans. And, and then the, the two in finals, though, he kind of disappeared. Exactly. But with, he finally gets going, ties the game early in the fourth, sets up a goal to put the Ds up seven, but then he had a late snap that hit the post that would have been a great goal to put the game away, would have put him up by 10 with 2.10 to go, and that early in the game, he was missing everything and decided to just be as dirty as possible to make up for it, which was just really stupid. Yeah, he got to spend the game for that bump of Crips. 
There was no concussion test there. There was none for Weedering as well. They said it was more of like a maybe a lower body issue rim that caught that made him stumble. I I don't know. I able. I'm very skeptical. But if there aren't any delayed concussion symptoms revealed in the next couple of days, I can give them the benefit of the doubt. It's just especially against the backdrop of you know the Lockie Jones and O'Lear one in Showdown a few weeks ago. It's just. I'm I'm surprised the league didn't say you got to check this guy. I would not be shocked if sooner rather than later the league just says, "Fuck it, we're going to have doctors there who are third party, like league employed." Yeah, I'm surprised. I I think is isn't that how the NFL does it? Yeah, I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet. I think it'll be implemented in the next couple of seasons. I think that's very likely. Oh yeah, uh, we'll, we'll point it out so BT doesn't have to. Ninety six thousand four hundred twelve. Largest crowd this season, largest semifinal crowd in 52 years. I love Brian Taylor, but it got really annoying. It's also funny telling just like how irritated he is that the Blues are this good. It's like between playing for Richmond and Collingwood, it probably... I didn't notice a lot of bias. I just noticed him talking every five seconds about how many people, you know, must be 92, 95,000. He just kept... I, I mean, like, if they're, if they're look, getting, we got it. There were a lot of people yeah, there. I mean, are they getting like live turnstile information from the MCC? I, I don't know. I'm actually curious about that because it seems to be games at the G where where it's talked about most. Maybe it's just because you get the huge numbers there, but also I'm maybe it's because he's the one calling those games. Maybe I'm I'm also just wondering, do, are they getting like live turnstile information? I don't think so. I think, you know, it just gets released sometime, usually in the fourth quarter. Yeah, but that, and here's the other weird broadcast thing I noticed. Normally, broadcasters are out to convince you that the team down five goals is still in it in the fourth quarter. And then with Melbourne up, like, what, five, seven, you were saying, you know, one more goal will put it out of reach. It's like, this totally goes against everything you've said all year. Oh, yeah, I want to point out, uh, Max Gorn kind of didn't decide to ride a He kind of put a goal back into play. Did you see that at all? Yes, I did. That was uh, the Clay Oliver shot that maybe like just inside 50, maybe beyond. After he got Sam Walsh holding the ball, this was just with a few minutes left. So when did Asava do that? Asava did that, I think, a couple years ago. That's why I don't remember it distinctly. But but just like a bunch of people like reposted the, the photo on the goal line of Radagalea punching it back in. So many things did have to go wrong for Melbourne to lose this game. And that kind of on the other side of the coin meant that so many things had to go right for the Blues. And I mean, congratulations to them. They're in a prelim for the first time since, is it 2000? Aha, uh-huh, found it. He was actually against it. Asava doing that was against Carlton in 2020. Oh, yeah, that that's not a game I'd remember. They were down seven goals at the time. Yeah, do not remember. I have no recollection of this one either. Yeah, it was uh, 2000 that the Blues were last in a prelim. That was played in August? Oh, you know what? They must have moved everything up to be able to have cross the country ready in time for the Sydney Olympics. I uh, thought that makes sense. Just like have all the AFL stuff out of the way. Um, this was from Swamp, I think. Last time the Blues played in the prelim, Sam Walsh was 55 days old and three members of their team from their semifinal, Ollie Hollins, Brody Kemp, and Jesse Motlop were not born yet. Sorry, all I can think of is Bart Simpson using the phrase chilling in dad's junk. What episode was that? Uh, I'm trying to find it. Season 19. Uh, uh, this was done on, let's see, it aired on, oh, this was an episode featuring Weird Al. It was January 2008. One of those kind of like breaking the timeline episodes. Oh yeah, Weird Al was totally in that one, huh? Some great fan reactions coming out of this, obviously, you know, all the blues fans out there, um, there was one video I saw of, like, Blues fans cheering a bunch when Jesse Motlop passed by a cafe in, like, the Carlton section of, the, of town that a bunch of Blues fans frequent. I, I think it was, like, Jesse and his family that were walking past after the game. Because I think it was his dad, Daniel Motlop, that uploaded the video. Um, I tuned in to the Blue Abroad fan cams after the game just to see them actually being happy. Because I remember one of the last times I'd really tuned into that to see Terry talk with everybody was just, like, at one of their saddest moments. Like, right before the winning streak. It was a better time. Not for then. And, uh, did we know that Robbie Williams is a bagger, or is that new? I think we knew a few weeks ago? I don't know. Yeah, um, went to the point that he, like, did a parody of some Australian song as a tribute to Tom DeConey. 
and, and he also like referenced a Stormzy rap line when talking about Michael Voss as well. It, it was good. And my response to that is book him for another grand final. Yeah, he's, I'm I'm fine with this year's grand final act, but Robbie delivered last year though. Yeah, he was he was really good. I loved, you know, I was kind of late getting into the venue for the watch party last year. I ended up I was going in there as Robbie's performance was going toward the end of things, and like at least half the bar was singing along with angels. It was pretty awesome. Robbie Williams take that. They're just like big everywhere except the United States and Canada. And I do not understand it. Is it just kind of radio not picking them up? When they were originally popular, I have no idea. Just weird music trends. But if Robbie Williams gets more Brits into the footy, I'm here for it. So now the Blues look ahead to a Saturday Twilight Grand Final with the Brisbane Lions. Just a one injury concern there for the Lions. I do want to mention a Jack ankle injury. Suffered that against Port sometime late in the game. I think he played through it, but is in a little bit of doubt for that prelim. So they held Darcy Gardner out of their VFL prelim. Big wash there considering how good of a job Payne did against Charlie Curnup. That was really one of the sticking points for me during their home and away match of just how good of a job Payne did there in that one-on-one. When we mentioned Josh Shackey earlier, Ethan, did we mention that he was completely unused? No. Yeah, Fourth unused sub this year. So you had what? The Swans did it twice or the Bulldogs did it twice? No, Bulldogs were the first one. Um, how was that? McNeil? No, it was Toby. Toby McLean. Yeah. And then I know the Swans did it with Clark and then Aaron Francis. In- okay, so it was two Swans, a Bulldog first, then two Swans, and now Shacky for the Who teams. was a Bulldog? Yeah. Weird stuff all around with unused subs, even the, in the tactical days. I did not expect an unused sub there, but I called how the sub would work out in the other semifinal, which we'll get to after the break. But uh, just to round out the Carlton stats here, I'd already mentioned their tough performers in Walsh and Newman. Patrick Cripps with 27 disposals, 16 contested possessions, 9 clearances. Adam Chera with 11 contested possessions in a 20 disposal performance for himself. That really opened up Walsh to more of an outside spot there, which... I'd anticipated with Cripps and Cheris strengths. Really, the only time we'd seen Walsh be that top contested player was round 24 when both those guys were out. Adam Saad. Woof. I'm going to edit out the silence that led to that. And thank you. Sorry, kind of just watching whatever pops up on my Twitter feed. Yeah, cool. But uh, Saad with 24 disposals. Uh, how many bounces? Forgot to write that down. Survey says four, which brings him to 52 on the season. Again, he had 113 last year in three fewer games. Mitch McGovern with 20 disposals. Jacob Wiedering, 19, 10 intercepts and 8 marks. He continued to play well after that potential concussion concern. Wow, that's tough to say. So, you know, evidence there that he's better than some may have thought in terms of his health? I don't know. But he's got to be in there against the Brisbane forward line. Melbourne were the more efficient team in terms of disposals inside 50. Just tells you how terrible it was that they weren't able to convert in front of goal. Blues plus seven in free kicks and plus 15 in tackles. Their pressure was stronger throughout the game. Jack Viney led the D's with 31 disposals, seven clearances, 485 meters. Clayton Oliver behind, 27 disposals, 15 contested possessions, nine tackles. Lockie Hunter, 25 disposals. Christian Petraka, a goal, 24 disposals, 15 contested possessions, 524 meters. Petraka getting all those contested possessions doesn't surprise me at the same time. Maybe having him be one of those top contest players isn't the move when you still have Viney in there. I would love to have seen some more run out of Petraka, kind of of have him be the next guy off those stoppages, have him more open to a Dustin Martin-like role. was talking with... uh, AFL from LA about this earlier today on Twitter. Just when you have Viney and Oliver in there and when Brayshaw's healthy as well, you don't have any contest concerns really. Maximize your numbers off those contests and really let Petraka run free is what I'd say would, would be the right move for 2024. Christian Salem, 22 disposals. Steven May with 21, 10 intercepts, 7 marks. And yet at the end, they had Bailey Fritch back there on that play and May up further forward. I, I, I mean, May was... Yeah. May was more of a rover. I, I would say keep Lieber furthest back and then May 2nd. I get why you have a good mark there in the back at the end. Once the Blues took the lead, they had Charlie Perno going back. No, I, I I get it. It's just you need to throw the forward that goes back as like the additional guy, not kind of displacing 
the guy who's actually supposed to do that. Ding, ding, ding. Tom Sparrow behind in 21 disposals, Ed Langdon a goal, and 20 disposals. I, I do like, and we'll talk about this more when we kind of eulogize the Ds in our 138th episode, Spectacular, but the way that both Langdon and Lockie Hunter were able to play on the wing this year, kind of opposite each other, was pretty impressive. So, like, there were things that were positive about this team and this team. It's just the negative for it, for it to end like this. I find it, you know, sadly fitting that this D's Blues semifinal was the last men's game in Ron Barassi's lifetime. The two clubs with whom he's most greatly associated, the two clubs for whom he played, he coached both of them, won eight of his ten flags associated with them. Crushing news always when, you know, one of the greatest figures of any field, sporting or not, dies. And I mean, it was clear just what kind of an impact his name still has on the footy community long after his playing and coaching career was over. I think it's pretty funny how many of the clips from Bounce, like in the intro to Cut the Crap and stuff, are like old quotes for him. Like some of the greatest old quotes of just like coaches yelling at people and stuff. Really influential. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I saw a bunch of them during the, the tribute that Seven had, just like, uh, like the one that stuck with me was just like, get possessions and I'll shut up. Something as simple as that. And I, I think there was one where he just like grabbed the phone, screamed, Healy off, whoever on. I think that was referring to Bravo medal- medalist Jared Healy, which makes it all that much funnier to me. Um, but I didn't realize that even before his playing career, he was influential. I mean, I guess it kind of started when he was five years old when his dad was killed in action because his desire to follow in his father Ron Sr.'s footsteps and him making that clear to the Melbourne Football Club was what led to them lobbying for the creation of the father-son rule. And we see the effect on that very clearly today. You look at the top two teams this year and look at the impact the father-son rule has on their list with the Dacos brothers and Darcy Moore at Collingwood, the youngsters in Ashcroft and Fletcher at Brisbane. And then you just consider how revolutionary Ron Barassi was during his playing career as that real ruck rover and then doing revitalizing and rebuilding jobs at a number of clubs as a coach, 10 flags between three clubs, beloved pretty much everywhere he had his hands on the game in Australia. And there have been calls for his name to be on the Premiership Cup. Really, what better honor would there be? People would say, oh, Victorian bias. Yeah, it was the Victorian League. Yeah, I think like Victorian bias for things before the league expanded, totally fine. And I don't know if there's been any player who's been associated with more flags than Ron Barassi himself. So, the Ron Barassi Cup. Go for it. You know, Benjamin, 78% of our listeners are between 18 and 35 years old, so they probably want to start a podcast like we did. How did you know that number, Ethan? Thanks to the analytics we have for Spotify for Podcasters. Formerly known as Anchor, sorry for you fans, Spotify for Podcasters has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer, no fancy software needed. It's so easy you can edit it while drunk. And Spotify for Podcasters doesn't just allow you to upload to Spotify, you can also distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Stitcher, and more just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free, you can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Hint, hint. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to podcasters.spotify.com to get started today. Hey, just a reminder, we are on both Twitter and YouTube at Americans Footy. YouTube activity will be a big priority for me in the off season. I am personally on Twitter at BenjaminHK01. I am on Twitter at Castle Media. Brian Harambe is on Instagram at Cat Name Brian. He's currently underneath the bed. We had to discipline him a little bit because he was starting to go after Ethan's posters. I got some good photos of him tonight. I'll post them. Yeah, one of them, he was was looking like he was checking himself out. Probably one of them was like, do these stripes make my butt look fat? I thought he was just like brushing some dirt off his shoulder. You know, ladies is pimps too. Was he feeling like a pimp? I don't know. All I know is ladies is pimps too. Go and brush your shoulders off. (laughs) One of the greatest rap lines. Uh, How did, how is nobody... Somebody's had to have used that as a yearbook quote, right? Oh, I'm sure. How did C.J. Wilson not? Nah, C.J. Wilson's not cool. That's the difference. Someone cool had to do it. C.J. Wilson uh, pitched in the majors for the Angels and Rangers. Total douche. 
He was he was known to a lot of people as just douche face. All I know now is that he has Mazda dealerships. I ain't buying a car from him. I wouldn't even waste my time with walking in there in a trench coat. Harry! I don't trust like that. Before we resume here with the uh, the AFL finals talk, just I guess a status update on some of the Australian punters in America, whether it's in college or the pros. I mean, a couple of continue to get action in the NFL. Um, I know Lou Headley's gotten his start with the Saints. Forgot that this, the 49ers punter Mitch Wisnowski is Australian as well. But mainly I was thinking about this because of this excellent kind of sideways coffin corner punt that Patty Turner from Colorado State University put on on Saturday night. It was unfortunate that despite that excellent punt that went out of bounds at the two-yard line, Colorado still went down, tied it, and won in overtime. Colorado State was more interested in committing personal fouls than playing football with the exception of Turner. What was it, like 11? I think it was 10. Either way, they between that and Norvell just playing not to lose, that that's why they lost. And also just a kid from San Francisco going off. Which was awesome. Like, like, I do not like Colorado at all, but this is a great story. Yeah, this is a kid that, that you obviously saw yeah. playing, playing at the Catholic school, at one of the Catholic schools. Yeah, he was like his team's number two wide receiver. He was kind of a slot receiver, wasn't even a tight end, and now he's a starting tight end at what's currently, because of the hype machine, one of the most talked about college football teams in the country. Like a team that has Lil Wayne performing before kickoffs, which is undeniably cool. It's going to be fun this week when they lose and give up like 200 yards to another kid that I watched play football for a long time. That being potential first round wide receiver Troy Franklin of Oregon. But I also remembered that Cal's punter is Australian Lachlan Wilson from Eaglemont, Victoria. He was previously at Tulsa, whose punter now, of course, is Brian Myers' friend Angus Davies, who and you said there are, there are photos of them celebrating together after the grand final last year. Yes, um, Davies this week. So Tulsa got to host Oklahoma, which had to end up being like the most expensive tickets in Tulsa history. See, unlike in Australia, people can resell tickets here for whatever price they want. It's weird to me that that's not really a thing in Australia, where you can't just go online and sell tickets at like 10 times space value for a big game. But yeah, uh, Tulsa got their asses kicked, but that meant that at least when they weren't getting intercepted, because uh, they got... He got picked off five times, but when that didn't happen, Angus got to punt. He punted five times, averaged a little over 40, had one go beyond 50, and two pinning Oklahoma inside the 20. So, good job, Angus. So, Oklahoma's actually gone to Tulsa, I believe now, four times this century? Wow, that's actually really surprising. Yeah, usually you don't see home and homes be scheduled like that for these power conference schools against smaller programs. Yeah, it's like the even in state, even when Tulsa is the second biggest city in the state and Norman's not far from Oklahoma City. Yeah, it's like you don't normally see Ole Miss or Mississippi State go to southern Mississippi. Which is a LSU sh- doesn't play at Tulane. Which is a shame also because Tulane's got a beautiful new stadium. But yeah, those things don't usually happen. Yeah, you, you could see them like having a having like a neutral site game. Like I wouldn't be shocked to see LSU and Tulane play at the Superdome in the future, especially if Tulane keeps up their winning ways. That would actually be fucking awesome, especially because Tulane used to have their home games there. But yeah, I, I was thinking this wasn't something that happened that often. Uh, you know what definitely doesn't happen that often? The Greater Western Sydney Giants reaching a prelim. Oh, I was just going to say two teams going out in straight sets in the same year and then lead into that. But I, I think but that, that, that that fits. Yeah, I think that hasn't happened since uh, 2014 when Frio and Geelong both went out in straight sets after finishing 4th and 3rd, respectively. Hey, look, it was 4th and 3rd again this time. I mean, that in theory, that makes sense. But yeah, Port Adelaide, 9-16-70, defeated by Greater Western Sydney, 13-15-93. You would think, just looking at the score, if you hadn't seen the game, you'd think, oh, Port were just inaccurate and pissed away some chances when they could have won this game. No, it was actually that they got smashed in clearances for most of the game, especially in the first half and trailed by 29 at halftime after a 5-goal to 1 second quarter, and it was just like a signature GWS burst there for about 10 to 12 minutes that ended up doing in the power. But also, after that, I mean, I I wouldn't think that many teams would be able to respond from being minus 77 disposals, minus 18 contested, minus 17 clearances in the first half, 
And yet, Ford had so many opportunities later on, and they kind of did a Crows and kicked one goal nine for the last. That said, like, if they had just gotten one, you start to think, oh, they're in it. But they ne- there was never, like, a, they got one, they need the next one. It was just it never happened. Like, both of us actually kind of dozed off with about 15 minutes left in this game. I, I was, like, halfway in it, so I- I've had, we both had extremely long weekends. Between work and it being the High Holy Days, shout out to Avaya for all of our Jewish listeners. Probably the Carlton listeners in particular will resonate with that, because I imagine a-, a decent amount of them probably missed the start of their final from being at services. At least it's not a grand final on Yom Kippur. But, but yeah, just was already a long Friday. Saturday and today, Sunday, when I recorded, this was, was even longer. So, I mean, by that point, it felt like the game had been decided. But looking back, you know, Charlie Dixon had that goal right at the start of the fourth. You're thinking, okay, can they get another? They didn't get another. Nine behinds to close out the game for Port. It wasn't ever really right there just because they could never finish. But I'm I'm focused much less on that and much more on how it got that bad in the first place. I mean, you think of Port as a team that's very good getting center clearances, and they just kind of got spanked there. And it was just a long sequence of center clearances turning into goals, and the Giants made it look pretty easy. Yeah, looking back at averages this year, in terms of clearances, Port were definitely above average in terms of total clearances per game, fifth in the league behind just... Brisbane, the Bulldogs, Adelaide, and Gold Coast. As those those all teams that make sense up there, GWS actually below average. I wonder if that just comes from early season struggles there and also times when Tom Green was out with a hamstring injury. But they just neutralized him at stoppage. Tom Green and Kieran Briggs getting a lot of his own clearances was huge there. I said in the preview it would be be tough for Port to match up against Briggs in the ruck. Very correct there. When Jeremy Finlayson came on, it was for Scott Lysette. I know he had a bit of an ankle concern during the game, but it was too obvious there. Briggs also seemed to deal with some sort of injury late that could put him in jeopardy this week. I, I would say it's still likely he plays. But yeah, yeah. He, he played through the left shoulder injury there for the last quarter plus. So he'll be in for the prelim. I would be shocked if he weren't. So Kieran Briggs against Mason Cox injected into my veins. I can't be mad at whoever wins that game. Either Mason's in a grand final or the Giants are in a grand final. I'd still very much prefer GWS getting in, obviously. Just look at that clearance difference. Yeah, the difference of 16, 45 to 29, and a double up at stoppage is 34-17 in the Giants' favor. Or of all teams getting dominated like that. And when you got the mix of Zach Butters, Jason Horn Francis, Ollie Watts, Connor Rosie getting blasted in there, it... I mean, that, that set the tone. Not able to get their hands on the ball at stoppage. The Giants with much more of the forward halftime and the better conversion when they were there as well. By the way, great Giants fan turnout from this one. I wonder if it was, I wonder if some of it was masquerading Crows fans. Wouldn't it surprise me? I love how like after the last goal with under six minutes to go, they just started hearing, poor our shit, poor our shit. It's like very audible. You could hear it like specifically on the left side of the broadcast going from the, um, the scoreboard end of the oval where all their fans were. Other things, um, Ryan Burton on Toby Green, not the matchup there, not the right fit. Ended up moving Miles Bergman on him later. I guess that was right. Yeah, I think that's the right move. Like matchup wise, that makes that makes some level of sense. You're not gonna put a leer on a guy like him. Basically, outside of a leer, I was not impressed with any port defender. I mean, Bergman as a ball mover, sure. Same goes for Houston, but like in terms of actual defending. Alir was the only one that I could say much about in terms of getting into one-on-one contests. And still, Jesse Hogan had a vice grip on the ball. Yeah, it's so scary what he's been doing lately. It- Remember when he could only hit tough shots? He had a share of misses in this game, but he ended up with 4-4, 17 disposals, 9 marks. Got plenty of guys that he can give it off to as well, especially if he... I mean, he was a deeper mark at this game, but if he gets... Marsh a little more upfield going toward like that 40 to 60 meter range. He's got plenty of guys that he can hand off to for overlap. So I'd love to see that more from them. But yeah, the last month or so, he's just been outstanding overall. Yeah, I'm just thinking like going forward, especially with this prelim, going to have even tougher matchups going ahead with Nathan Murphy and Darcy Moore. Maybe, yeah, bring him upfield and have even someone like Lockie Whitfield. I'm, I would say Harry Hillborn would be a great one to have in there as well. 
try to like have two people go in for overlap sometimes see if see if one of them gets blocked out but the other gets free for it because hogan's marking that that can't be questioned his accuracy is one thing his marking top tier you mentioned Himmelberg. I thought he was really good. I don't think he gets enough for it. The whole GWS backline played pretty darn well in this game. There was like one instance where I thought, man, Sam Taylor was aggressive there, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. And despite missing all that time, I think the only reason that he ended up missing out on the All-Australian team was because he only played 15 games. Had he gotten in round 24, I, I think he would have made it. Yeah, I think so. And in the starting 18, so much talk is around Taylor that guys like Himmelberg are often kind of cast aside in terms of the commentary and analysis. Jack Buckley has gotten his praise at times this year. Didn't think that this was his strongest game, but did well enough. But Himmelberg, here's a guy who we thought, man, that, that was a total Chris Collinsworth move. Here's a guy. I, I was just going to say, I'm <laughs> disappointed you caught yourself. Harry Himmelberg, here's a guy who we thought was a lock to be forward with all the structure that the Giants already had back there. Then Callum Brown emerges as that four mark with his speed as well. And despite his accurate kicking for goal, you send Harry back there and he can match up on the Rucks, which he did in this game. He did go up with Charlie Dixon. So next week, are we looking at Himmelberg maybe on, I don't know, what do you say, Dan McStay? Ooh, I like that. Well, what is, does Taylor go to Mayacek then? I think so, because Mayacek, when he's on, he's on. And I don't like the thought of anybody but your best going up against him. But like, I would say start with Taylor on Mayacek, Himmelberg on McStay, Jack Buckley then on Darcy Cameron. Sure. Heck, you could honestly consider when he's been playing well, which he has lately, you could honestly consider putting Buckley in against Mayacek even. And then there's the wild card of September Mason Cox to talk about. The other scary thing when it comes to the Giants, this clearance dominance, this stoppage dominance they had here against Port, Collingwood will be without Taylor Adams. Hamstring injury there, taking him out of the prelim and maybe the grand final as well. Cannot catch a break come September. So just another opportunity opens up there for GWS to pick on Tom Mitchell, maybe a bit more at those stoppages. I thought Port looked pretty flat in this game. You could tell they were playing hurt for one. The second quarter, they just looked flat. You know, first quarter was a really fun back and forth. That was like, Really fun finals, buddy. Actually, you know this, this round felt more like finals than the prior week did. Like, Melbourne Carlton was the best final since Geelong beating Collingwood last year. I, I still will go with the Geelong Collingwood game over that. I just think the level of play was higher, but this was still, this was like one of the best finals I've seen still. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, thinking about how the Giants employed Sam Taylor, he was more doing some roving work last week. And I'm not sure if that's as feasible, though, with how tall the Collingwood forward line can go. It was really Buckley that had the job on Todd Marshall, who again was playing hard with a hip injury. So Giants have options here. Do you have Taylor as the rover or do you have him as the top one on one? I think you have him roving because there aren't that many guys on Collingwood that you expect to go off for four or five if he doesn't cover them. So, so then maybe you switch him on to someone if someone gets hot. But if not, I think you just I think you just have him rove. I think, though, Himmelberg on McStay is the right matchup there. Admittedly, the Giants' inaccuracy in the middle quarters in which they kicked 7-11. Admittedly, he was wearing shoes, but that's even worse. That wasn't 7-11. No, oh, I know. Admittedly. Admittedly, dumb fuck. Yeah, right. Yeah. But just the Giants being a bit inaccurate there did keep the door open for Port. And then Port said, inaccuracy? What inaccuracy? I can be inaccurate. Here, let me show you. Want to see me be inaccurate? Want to see it again? I, I I still think, even with that, the better team won this game, and I think the margin was pretty appropriate. Just, Port is not a team you expect to get beaten up in center clearances like that, and it was really the entire second quarter. And beaten up in clearances in general throughout the game. I think some of that has to do with the Giants setting up so well behind the clearance, behind the stoppage, being able to go back out to that first down behind there so well. But it was the stoppages and their spread of the oval. It, that was where their speed really had an effect there. Steven Canelio, the, the couple weeks off, clearly did him good because this was one of his best games. To put up 30 disposals, 13 scored moments, 489 meters, and kick 2-1 in an away semifinal at age 29 is a pretty special performance. Isn't it fun? We talk about 29-year-olds like they're so old. That's what happens when you're playing at the top level at age 18. This is like the aging curve in soccer 
seems ridiculous, and then you have the funny aging curve that's on just a completely different level. Like, if, if you're 35, you're washed most of the time, usually before that. Like, it's a shock in Major League Baseball to see guys playing into their 40s. We have a few of them. If you're playing into your 40s in the AFL, you are either one of the greatest players ever or just insanely durable. Or both. I would love to see how far Scott Pendlebury goes, by the way, thinking about that. Because he's 35. This week will be game number 382 for him. He could have a crack at Boomer's record if he really wants. 427 isn't completely out of question. I don't know if it's likely. I wouldn't call it likely, but I'd call it, like, I don't know, 10% chance? Mm. I mean, that's a little generous. Say if, if they get bounced in the prelim by GWS, that would put him at 382. He'd need to play 45 games over two seasons when you got a chance to play 54 or 56 if they make the grand fight. 400, I think, is guaranteed. Yeah, I, I, unless he suffers like a major injury this year or the start of next, which, God, I hope that does not happen. If anybody should get to 400, I want it to be him. Like, on a team where there are so many polarizing and unlikable figures, you don't see people saying things against Pendlebury. No, you, you don't. Shit, I'm excited for this Colin with GWS Freeland. I just, I can't see a way the Giants win it, but it would be awesome if they did. It would be so fun. Like, of all the teams to take them out in, like I said before, GWS, they're, they're just kind of a troll club in a lot of ways between their history, their small fan base, the lack of, I don't want to say shit club, no history. No, because like, that, that wouldn't be the Suns, or I guess you could even say Frio. I'm kind of shocked thinking about it that Eagles fans haven't done that at a Western Derby. But yeah, I... The big, big sound memes, the social media trolling. The Giants are a great troll club, and, like, Toby Green as the captain of the troll club is too perfect. It's just, it would be so cool. I just, and I don't know if I can't see it happening. I, I have a feeling Bobby Hill is going to play a big part in taking them down, which is going to be really frustrating. Is it Captain Toby that gets in a shoving match with Bobby Hill? Nah. Who do you think, then? I, wouldn't it make sense to be a defender? Like, maybe, I don't know, Taylor or Buckley? Uh, Isaac coming. Okay, yeah, I could I could believe that. Also, just thinking about how differently we view this Giants team from when they last played Collinwood round nine. They were three and six after that game. And at that time, it was like, well, this is the first time they really gotten their butts kicked. Maybe this is going to be a point where they fall off. Even so, they've been better than anticipated. 12 and 4 cents. What a story. Lockie Whitfield with a game-high 33 disposals. Tom Green, 29 disposals, 17 contested possessions, 8 clearances, 577 meters. Those 8 clearances earned him a lot of positive reviews, and it's like, oh, that's why they can afford to let Tim Taranto go. Canelio got the 10 votes, Jesse Hogan with 8, Tom Green and Lockie Whitefield with 5 each. So Canelio and Sam Walsh got perfect 10s. Harry Himmelberg. Harry! 24 disposals, 581 meters. Callan Ward with 24. Josh Kelly, who I know you've been huge on this year, a goal with 21. Well, what, when Canelio and Tom Green have been out at various points and with Toby Green playing downfield, Kelly's impact has been really noticeable. And I, I just almost think he was overlooked at times before this, which is shocking considering the performance he's put on. Lockie Ash with 20. Jack Buckley, 18 disposals, 10 intercepts. Kieran Briggs, despite the shoulder injury, 32 head outs, 15 disposals, 8 clearances. Again, I think, like, of all the individual stories, of all the players that you expected to be big contributors to this Giants team, he and Buckley have to be the least likely, right? I mean, Buckley didn't play last year after a major injury. Neither did Brett Daniels. Yeah, but Daniels we knew about as a quality player. But Briggs, I mean, he came in after that Collingwood game. He came in round 10. It was Matt Flynn who had the job before that. Flynn's been relegated to, to reserves. I mean, Flynn's been relegated to Toby Conway's VFL highlight reel. Right. I mean, on the older end, Talon Ward still being so productive at, at 33 it is awesome as well. But he's been so steady there for the Giants since being a day one player from the club coming up, going over from the dogs. I mean, would love to see him be able to get a premiership medal. This is year 16 for him. If you told me before the season the Giants are going to play in a prelim, I would have guessed Aaron Cadman had to have like a 60-goal season, right? Now he's been chilling in the VFL. 
Toby with another three goal performance, but just the three goals, two behinds, 15 disposals. So not his not his best game, which means he could go do something big this week. Um, and we don't think it's get suspended, by the way. You were talking about somebody having a 60 goal season. Uh, Captain Toby did that in the home and away. There you go. Um, speaking of Toby, the Giants are 3-0 against Collingwood when he scores at least. I think it's just when he scores multiple goals against him, they're 3-0. Yeah, they're 0-7 when he only scores one or goes scoreless. So, uh, trends to watch for there. Isaac coming a goal, only 11 disposals, I believe it was, but racked up eight tackles. Giants with 95 more disposals. They nearly doubled Porton hitouts, 43-22. They took 25 more marks, and the only reason Porta la- laid 11 more tackles was that they didn't have the ball. Considering how much GWS dominated possession that Port only won tackles 57-46 is really a negative reflection on the effort and motor and speed they played with. And there were times for this game where they just weren't up to the challenge. Like, going into halftime, there's an interview with, was either Rosie or Butters, who just said, like, yeah, we got to be better in the contest. Basically, without saying, like, we played like we didn't care. Or just, we played like shit in the, in the contest. Yeah. There's a lot to question there, and we'll have fun breaking down this what ended up being a really interesting Port Adelaide season in the spectacular. Butters did lead Port with 25 disposals. Danny Houston with 22, 12 contested, 7 tackles, and 538 meters. We'll continue to say deserving All-Australian for Houston. Travis Boak, is this his final game? We don't know. There are rumors that the club is saying, you're done. Two behinds, 21 disposals, 11 contested, 625 meters. I would say when when he's, you know, one of the, the clear best players for them in a game that people instantly want to forget, I think that's a sign, no, you got to keep this guy around for at least one more go. Jason Horn, Francis kicking 1-1 from 20, Kane Farrell with 18 disposals and 642 meters, Miles Bergman, 15 disposals, 483 meters and a behind, Jed McEntee with 12 disposals and 7 tackles, still would have liked to see Frank Evans in ahead of him, just we're big Frank Evans believers. You're going to hear that a lot from us. And he found his scoring touch, unlike McEntee, near the end of the year. So, more questions to have there. Fun fact. Raises eyebrow. None of the 10 AFL.com analysts picked GWS to make finals. Sarah Ollie was the only one that even had them at 9th. Everyone else had them 11th to 14th. Of the 28 surveyed for Fox Footy, none had the Giants in finals. The other ones that nobody had in finals were Hawthorne, West Coast, and North. And nobody had the Crows? All right. But yes, St. Kilda, Essendon, and Gold Coast each had one. Nobody had the Giants. And here they are in the final four. And yet, all these great things about the Giants, none of the events in that game were the most interesting thing to happen at a Greater Western Sydney game this weekend. That would be the snake at Blacktown. So... Earlier in the day on Saturday, GWS hosted Richmond in a women's game that the Tigers ultimately won, pulling away in the fourth. But it was delayed by a red-bellied black snake on the oval. Small little thing, but clearly venomous, accounting for I think it was about a sixth of venomous snake bites in Australia over the last recorded period. I'd be surprised this wasn't a Queensland thing. You know, Queensland is the, uh, the state with all the stuff that can kill you. I mean, a bit further north than Victoria still, so kind of getting up there. Then again, you know, these snakes, these bites are venomous, but not usually fatal. Maybe that's why the uh, snake catcher decided, yeah, I'll just pick this up with my bare hands. The guy had an amazing beard. He looked like if you asked a random American, like, what would an Australian snake catcher look like? They'd come up with something pretty similar to this guy. And Sonia Hood basically said that as well on Twitter. Is the snake catcher the main character? I feel like, no, he's the main character of around an AFLW. Yeah, in, in terms of, that wasn't, you know, part of anything to do with any final, so I can't quite go with that. Well, yeah, he's the clear AFLW main character. Um, Or is it the snake itself? I would say the snake catcher still. It's, it's the snake catcher. With the snake placing second? I guess. But seriously, though, who was the main character this week? Is it Blake Akers? Is it Robbie Williams? Is it just straight sets? I think that's the best pick. Straight sets? Yeah, I, I, I like that. I mean, we had abstract concepts be main characters before. You go back to 
Round eight, it was inaccurate Sunday kicking when teams combined to kick 54-78 over those three games. Ooh, was that the uh, Saints of North? I don't even want to go back and look out of fear that it was. Round eight. Yes, it was. My gosh. Those two teams combined to kick 12-26. You also had... That was the worst game of the year, and it wasn't close. Yeah, you also had, what, Essendon and Port, where Port couldn't kick straight for three quarters. Then they finally got it in the fourth, and Essendon suddenly couldn't kick straight. You have the Swans missing a bunch of opportunities to stay close with Collingwood at the G. And then uh, in round number 10, do you remember what round 10 was? Nope. The number 76. Ah, yes. For the uh, North Interchange breach. So yeah, um, straight sets. Your main character for the semifinals. If you're looking for something overarching, it's that. Uh, there was no really, like, super sexy goal, but there were a couple of good marks. I think Tom DeConing was the one I preferred. Yeah, which is probably what inspired Robbie Williams to sing that tune. Getting the one over Trent Rivers, kind of the knee to the back of the head thing going on. Jesse Hogan had a nice one as well over a Lear Lear and with not much space to, to go up with Trent McKenzie being behind him. But yeah, if you're looking for a play of the week, it's it's Tom DeConing and your main character is straight sets. So yeah, 138th episode spectacular coming up in a couple days time, probably right after we get the lists for the prelims like we did for the semifinals. I think that was a really good move just talking strategy wise. So look to that. Until then, just keep up with us on Twitter and YouTube at Americans Footy. If you want to keep up with me for some weird reason, BenjaminHK01 on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Castle Media. Brian Harambe is on Instagram at Cat Named Brian. They are both more interesting follows than me.